So it's, it's a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Nicole uh, Kempnitz from Oxford University. And he will speak about the right analytic geometry. Welcome. Thank you. Well, maybe we can wait for Joseph. <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, uh, first I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. It's a great honor to speak uh, in this birthday conference. Um, the one interesting thing, is, so like you've heard, uh, Joseph's uh, actual birthday was about two months ago. And for some reason I know four people who have the same birthday as Joseph. Well, three and then Joseph as well. And they're very important in my life. I don't know what that means. That's uh, an <laughs> observation. Um, and um, I think what, what I, I learned many things from, from Joseph. But one of the two main things that were already mentioned, uh, the first thing is his kindness. And the second thing is, um, well, you know, someone said, I think, like his optimism. I mean, mathematical <laughs> optimism. Uh, which I'm trying to imitate. Uh, so some of the, this idea that, uh, well, there, there's really no need to use brute force anytime. I mean, if, uh, if you feel like you need to use it, it just means that you don't understand the problem. So, uh, so really a, a true understanding of things makes everything simple and beautiful. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to achieve, but the wonderful thing about Joseph is that he just shows how to do it, and we can just try and learn and copy him. So thank you for that. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, derived analytic uh, geometry. Um, well, local and global, and I'll try to give some uh, sort of an overview of a very large project. So, uh, in terms of, uh, so this is joint. So, main collaborator is uh, is Oren and Basad, um, and uh, but also Federico Bambozzi and my student, uh, Craig Smith, <coughs> are involved. So, <coughs> so the, the aim of this is somehow to give um, sort of like a framework for analytic geometry that 
well, will be as simple and pos as possible, and will work in all possible uh, situations. So, in other words, so we want to sort of it needs to be sort of easily go in the derived directions and the stacky directions. So, without any any thought, somehow <laughs> just work. Um, it should be sort of both work in the local and the global setting. And uh, it should also be, be able to deal with, uh, uh, well, with all possible kinds of sort of sheaves you would want, especially sort of like quasi-coherent sheaves or maybe D modules, uh, things of that form. Again, all of this should just come in some sense for free. So some of the idea is that if you have the right framework, all of this just, uh, you know, we have big machineries today of uh, infinity categories. Uh, I mean, all, if you have a good framework, then all the rest just follows. Yeah. Uh, so global would mean, I'll, I'll talk about this, but for instance, over a, a Banach ring. So, for instance, suppose you want to do analytic geometry over Z, um, over a ring of integer of a number field. Uh, and local? Uh, local would mean that you want to do it over QP or over R or C or something like that. Essentially, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and the idea is that really all of this somehow should come from, you know, I should say, some, something like first uh, principles. Uh, so, and, uh, and I guess the, the inspiration comes from the fact that, well, if you think what algebraic geometry is, um, again, you know, if you read, read Hartron's book, it might seem like what you're doing is, uh, you, know, you start with a lot of work of defining some topological spaces, uh, you know, some the risky spectra, and then you glue them together. And, but then from a, a different perspective, which existed, you know, it's sort of two parallel and equivalent ways of thinking about algebraic geometry is, a, is the functor of points approach. So the so first principle is essentially sort of a functor of points. And so that's what we try to do. And uh, so and in some sense, so the question is, what, what are your test objects? So after you know your test objects, then the rest just follows. So uh, I want to start with some you know, advertisement about an alter alternative history of mathematics. So this is somehow something we can call sort of topology. Uh, uh, versus Bornology. Um, I'll move over there. Uh, so somehow historically, well, we're used to thinking about uh, mathematics. Uh, well, a big part of uh, you know, 20th century mathematics and what we do has to deal with topological spaces or topological vector spaces. And I guess what I want to say now is that perhaps this was the wrong choice. I mean, it's maybe very natural to think about continuity but, uh, uh, and open sets, but in a similar way you can, instead of that, think of boundedness and bounded sets. And it seems like, just from a purely formal perspective, this has much better properties. And lots of problems that you sort of encounter when dealing with topological vector spaces disappear for very simple reasons. Um, so, so suppose we start, well, and we have some normed field, um, which we can, assume, I mean, for, let's even assume it's complete, it's, you'll see. So, uh, so the point is we can define different nice categories like uh, sort of, of semi-normed spaces over K and normed spaces over K and also Banach spaces over K, we assume maybe some completeness. Um, and the nice thing is that, that all of these categories are sort of nice categories. So what do I mean by nice categories? So let's, for instance, focus on Banach spaces over K. Um, so first thing that, well, one good 
feature about this category is that it's, uh, it has a closed symmetric monoidal structure. So if you have two Banach spaces, uh, V and W, you can take well, their completed tensor product, which is sometimes called the projective tensor product, um, and this gives a, a symmetric monoidal structure on this category. And there, but it's closed, so there are also, I mean, if I, I can look at sort of the inner home between two Banach spaces, which is, well, as a set, it's the same as the home. It's this, the set of bounded maps, but of course, this is a Banach space as well um, with the operator norm. Um, so, so this is one thing. So whenever you have a closed symmetric monoidal category, this means you can do algebra. That's uh, the first uh, good thing about this. The same is true for sort of norm and semi-norm. You can, of course, then you don't need to take completions. Um, now, another good thing is that Banner spaces actually has more sort of good structure. It's sort of what's known as uh, quasi-abelian. Uh, what quasi-abelian means um, is, well, so it's not an abelian category. I mean, and I think uh, many of the sort of counter examples when, when you learn about abelian categories, you learn that well, topological groups or uh, Banach spaces are not uh, abelian exactly because you can see that the image and co-image, uh, they don't coincide. But, uh, but it's close enough. So somehow still uh, a good way of saying it is that you can still, well, it has kernels and co-kernels and you can look at sort of uh, short exact sequences that come from a sort of a kernel co-kernel. Um, and, and these short exact sequences, they form a quill and exact structure. So somehow if you've, you know, a good way of dealing with things which are, you know, to trying to do homological algebra in general is to maybe introduce some quill and exact structure on the category. But the nice thing about Banner spaces and other categories of this form is that they come with their own natural uh, quill and exact structure of just kernels, co-kernels. Uh, which means that we can easily do sort of <coughs> derived uh, sort of categories for Banner spaces. It's sort of completely imposed on us. We don't need to think of how to do it. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's somehow, in some sense, maybe you can say the starting point of analysis. And now let's see an another property. So Banner spaces, th this category is is finitely complete and co-complete. Uh, but it's not complete and co-complete. So you cannot take, for instance, like an, an infinite co-product of Banner spaces exactly because of these uh, boundedness issues. I mean, this, this doesn't exist as a Banner space. And similarly with sort of uh, an infinite product of Banner spaces. It's not well, you'll get the Frechet space, but it's not a, it's not a Banner space. So, so now you can ask yourself, how do you deal with the fact that it's not complete and co-complete? And you can make two choices. And, and now what I'm going to do is sort of tell you how sort of uh, the history of mathematics in, uh, went, in, in, but in, in a way that people didn't phrase it in that uh, sense. So I can look at sort of pro Banner spaces. Or I can look at in Banner spaces. In other words, I can sort of uh, look at just formally add uh, inductive limits or projective limits to the category of Banner spaces. Um, so this is a purely you know, formal category theoretic operation. Um, or if you want, I can do something similar with norm spaces uh, or pro norm spaces. Um, now, all the theory that somehow when you do analysis and you learn about sort of locally convex vector spaces uh, over K or maybe complete locally convex vector spaces, you're looking at sort of families of norms and you're exactly working in this sort of pro side. That's what, and actually you can prove quite precise theorems about the relationship between locally convex vector spaces and these pro constructions. Uh, the, but the problem with this is that uh, whenever you have a, a closed symmetric monoidal category and you take its uh, pro-completion, well, it's still symmetric monoidal, but it's not closed anymore. Just because of the, the 
the junction sort of goes in the, in the wrong way. Now, when you take it in, it's still closed symmetric monoidal. So this, so this is closed symmetric monoidal. It's complete. It's co-complete. Co-complete. Uh, and it's still quasi-abelian. Uh, this side, well, has all these properties except of being closed. Of course, if uh, you have a symmetric monoidal structure which is not closed, then this means that the tensor product, for instance, would not be uh, right exact. So, all the, and so you immediately see all the problems you face when you deal with topological vector spaces about the, well, you have a projective tensor product, it's not right exact. Uh, so you introduce an injective tensor product and it's closed, but it's not associative. All, all of these uh, headaches you have on this side, they just disappear here. Well, that there's an inner form, that the tensor product has a <laughs> right adjoint. So, so on the inductive side, it's, it's co-complete, but it's also complete? Yes, because if you have a category which was, because it was finitely complete and co-complete, then by adding, uh, <coughs> adding sort of filtered co-limits, you actually also add all limits, or s similar by adding sort of uh, limits, you add all co-limits. This is sort of uh, I mean, all of the not only because so it's not for shade, it's like local context here. In the left side. Yeah. 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 Yes. So it, this has all limits and co limits, yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so this side is so this this is somehow where you sort of think about locally convex vector spaces and you have sort of families of norms and here these are things that somehow are well locally Banach spaces uh, so a thing you can do for a Banach space you can think about you know, like the unit ball or things like that so this this comes with notions of what boundedness means and this comes with notions of what open means so th these are sort of essentially bornological spaces bornological spaces uh, are a subcategory of in Banach spaces of essentially monomorphic object. So if you look at system where, which are equivalent where to maps being monomorphic. Um, but actually the derived categories are equivalent, so it doesn't really matter which one you work with. Um, yeah, so, so, the, so the nice thing is that uh, we can just, so uh, it's easy to do algebra. In, in the ban over k. It has, so just, it's, a, it's very similar to doing it over vector spaces. It's a, it has a closed symmetric monoidal structure. We can define, you know, notions of algebras or co-algebras, bi-algebras. Uh, you can easily define, you know, Hochschild homology, uh, cotangent complexes, everything you want, just uh, essentially works for free. You don't need to sort of figure out how to do it. Uh, um, one, one thing to notice is that, uh, just a remark. I'm sorry, just one question. Yep. So when you write in the band K, yep. you mean the indization or you mean something more? No, that's it, yeah. It's the indization. That's not a completion, right? Just, oh, you can indize it, okay. Well, it's... It's a universal uh, category. You know, for any category C, I can define N C, which uh, sort of formally add the filtered co-limit. Yeah. But in this, but if the category you started with was already uh, uh, finitely complete and co-complete, this uh, actually you just need one of them. Then this thing would be complete and co-complete. You mean if the if the category is already co in the no, no, no. So it's, it's not complete, but some of the limits still exist. Right? Ah, the finite. Well, still the finite limits, and in this case, there are only finite limits and co-limits. There. Are. No. 
so one thing to notice is that if I look at uh, vector spaces over K, which are finite dimensional, then they sort of sit inside Banner spaces over K. Um, and then, uh, so if I look at end vector spaces over K, finite dimensional, uh, would sit inside. And this is also like a symmetric monoidal functor um, inside in ban K. And now in vector space finite dimensional, this is just vector spaces over K. So, so this category also contains just usual algebra in it. So whenever you have a standard algebra, you can think about it as a bornological algebra. For instance, look at bornological modules. It makes sense or, um, so, so usual algebra is in there. And Well, so it's a, so bornological uh, is equivalent to the subcategory of essentially monomorphic objects in here. Which monomorphic? Yeah, to systems which are equ equivalent to ones where all the maps are monomorphisms. Okay. So s things which are, and then the, the point is that, I, uh, well, ban I mean, Banner space is sort of is like sort of a concrete category. I mean, you can you can think of it as a as a set with extra structures. I mean, and now when you when you take a end of a concrete category, you don't get a concrete category. But if you look at essentially monomorphic object, it still will be a concrete category. So, in that sense, you can describe objects in here as sets or vector spaces with extra structure, with notion of boundedness. Uh, uh, but these are sort of more mysterious objects. They contain sort of arbitrary things. So when you said concrete category, you refer to like Homer as mathematical notion? Or yeah, that the, there's a fateful functor into sets. I didn't get no fateful functor between these two sets? Well, at least not, not, not the one which is compatible with the one you, yeah, not the natural extension would not be. That, that's an easy exercise, but the, but for the essentially monomorphic one, it would be. So I think historically people thought about bornological spaces, right? In analysis, big theorems uh, are when you say that sort of uh, boundedness and continuity are equivalent for which spaces this is true. Uh, and, and then people thought, okay, so let's define vector spaces with notions of bounded sets. And this was the original definition of bornological uh, vector spaces. But then it was realized you can sort of think about in Banach spaces. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that it takes you out. No, no, everything is still nice there. Um, the nice thing here is that the, this is, a, again, a concrete category, and well, so you can compute like the limits and co limits are sort of easier to explain how they look like. Limits in here exist, but writing them down is not so nice. Um, and, and it's important to note that, of course, uh, as I said, so. This, this category, for instance, is co-complete. So just for general reasons, there is a functor from here to here. Uh, and in general, you can sort of, so for at least for nice uh, locally convex vector spaces, well, if, you know, for Shea or Bornological and so on, uh, there is, this functor is fully faithful. So a big part of analysis, definitely I think all of analysis that people usually look at, uh, for Frechet sure or dual Frechet sure vector spaces embeds in here. So you can really do it in here, but enjoy the fruits of that it's easy to do algebra, where here it's not so easy to do. Not, not on everything, but for some objects it is. And these are the sort of you know, nice objects. Um, um, well, there, sure, so, so this category is a closed symmetric monoidal category. There is a dual object, so, right? They can... Well, by dual you mean sort of, there, so for each bornological space I can define it's uh, you know, dual, which is the inner home into K. Oh. This would not be, of course, the, well, you would have an evaluation map, right? as usual, but not, 
it wouldn't be a duality. It's, well, I don't have, I mean, the interesting thing is that actually you, you can see that um, there are lots of, uh, well, this category contains lots of reflexes. Even for usual vector spaces. Yeah. So what can you more than that? But it's nice, one interesting thing about this is that this category has lots of uh, reflexive objects. Uh, so, for instance, nuclear fresh air or dual, dual nuclear fresh air are reflexive. Well, this is sort of maybe similar here, just only here you have to sort of say which uh, dual object you mean. Here it's sort of forced on you. Um, and, uh, yeah, so reflexivity and nuclearity, which are related to dualizability, are nice here. But sort of if you're really dualizable, then you're finite dimensional. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, but I mean, maybe with that sort of another uh, remark is that uh, you can, um, well, going sort of, uh, using that you can define sort of like Bornological. So this is something that uh, my student Craig is working on. You can, Bornological quantum groups. Uh, in some sense, just sort of mimicking what you do in the algebraic setting, just working in that setting. So th these will be some completions of quantum groups. These things have appeared sort of in some C star theoretic world, but they're very complicated there. Exactly because the tensor product is not very nice. So you have to work with some. You have half algebra yeah. So you can define, in the C star world, you have to def work with this sort of multiplier algebras and some, you don't need to do this in this setting. And another interesting thing, which is important for later, if I have some Bornological algebra A, I have a nice category of A modules. Um, just, again, for free, and, uh, and it inherits all the nice, if, let's say if A is a commutative algebra, it inherits all the, the properties of, uh, of Bornological spaces. It's still a closed symmetric monoidal category. It's quasi-abelian, so uh, sometimes I would write this, this is sort of quasi-coherent. She is on maybe spec A, but, uh, but that's, it's a nice category. And, and it's one interesting application for this is also in the C-infinity world. Uh, suppose you want to understand what are, if you have a manifold, M, you want to define some sort of quasi-coherent sheaves on a manifold. Um, uh, you, can, you can do that using the sort of Bornological machinery. And which is important if you want to define sort of D modules on the manifold. But I won't, I won't talk about this today. Um, now, some more properties. So let's see. So, more properties of Banner spaces. Um, so, well, if we look at vector spaces, over k, which sort of are finite dimensional or general, this is sort of generated by uh, just k itself, right? Um, by that I mean uh, we can just sort of take uh, finite co-limits of k and get everything. Now we can ask what happens with sort of uh, Banach spaces over k. So it's generated by what? Um, now, the inter another interesting structure that Banach spaces have is that we have, inside Banach spaces, we have the subcategory that has the same object, oops, the other way around, but has only maps which are non-expanding. So that if I can look at maps such that their norm is less than one. Now, the interesting thing about this category, this is complete and co-complete. My, yeah, they come, uh, sure, yeah. They come with a norm, yeah. Um, so, so this category is complete and co-complete. And, uh, and then what we can do is, well, so essentially I can look at sort of, uh, let's call it maybe L1 of I. So this will be the contracting, so the co-product in here of the field K. I times. So, well, what this is are just sort of summable sequences. And notice that 
I didn't assume that, so there are different versions you can do. So your field can be Archimedean or non-Archimedean, and then you can, something that people usually don't do, but turns out to be actually important if you want to do global things, over a non-Archimedean field, you can look at sort of Archimedean Banach spaces. It makes sense. Uh, so for instance, some mobility is a different notion if you work in a non-Archimedean, I mean, well, these categories are different if you work with Archimedean and non-Archimedean Banach spaces. I, I won't go into these details now, but, uh, but the point is that these things here, they sort of form, they generate uh, Banach spaces over K. And, uh, and they are sort of, actually, they're projective. Uh, is just a, a set. Yeah. L1 of I. Well, it's the contracting co-product. So this category has, is complete and co-complete. So I can define there are functors which I write like this. Well, there's also this one. Yeah, so this is the coproduct in here, which is not the coproduct in here, which is the formal coproduct. I mean, I could take the, this one, but that, this wouldn't give me the generators of the category. Um, so this is projective and well, small, um, which gives you sort of very interesting uh, sort of conclusion from that is that well, if what I can do is I can, well, I started with this in ban k, and like I told you, most of analysis can really be done there. Now, this, this category is quasi-abelian, so quasi-abelian categories naturally sit inside an abelian category. If you want a good way of saying it is that the derived category has a sort of a canonical t-structure, and the heart of this t-structure is, well, there are two, but it's sort of the left heart of this category, which you can describe quite explicitly. Um, well, because there are two choices of uh, t-structure, you know, on, on the derived category. Because it is not a bit. Yes. Um, so essentially objects in here are just, uh, you know, pairs of objects uh, where v into w, but this map is not necessarily strict. So the image is not closed necessarily. Um, and then, uh, so this category is actually equivalent to the following thing. You can just look at additive functors from this collection of, well, the subcategory just given by these L1i. Uh, maybe I should write op somewhere uh, into abelian groups. Right. So this is essentially a Yoneda or a Freud representability theorem. But what this is telling you, right? This is a completely algebraic uh, object, right? In some sense, if you just look at the, you take the endomorphism of, of these, you get some huge ring, which is very explicit, but like, you know, you, you look at maps between different L1s for different cardinalities. I'm not getting into sort of size is issues that I probably need to t pick two universes, and when I say end of something, what do I mean by that? Um, but, it's a, but what this is, is just algebra. So in other words, from this perspective, you get uh, that analysis equals algebra. Or, well, not equal, it's contained in algebra. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah. Well, but like I said before, if, I mean, because vector spaces are actually contained in Banach spaces, then you have, in some sense, an <laughs> so you can sort of... <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to study all of analysis, again, I... I Just uh, I'm looking at additive functors from, so since these are sort of uh, a, a set of small generators. What's the second thing? Abelian groups. Abelian groups. Oh, yeah. And maybe I, I would ask, what is the third thing? I, well, this is the subcategory uh, on, the full subcategory on these objects. Oh, okay. But, so in particular, it doesn't depend on the norm? What do you mean? There, these are Banner spaces, right? They, they have a norm. Uh, well, when, when you want to compute the func for instance, the endomorphism of such an object has to do with bounded morphisms between these things, and this depends on the norms, yeah. Okay, the main thing is that these guys generally do. 
Yeah. Okay. It's, a, it's a set of, well, projective small generators. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, another thing to sort of notice is that uh, if I take uh, the projective tensor product over K with such a contracting product over some set I, uh, this is canonically isomorphic. And again, this comes for free because sort of tensor commutes with, yeah? I mean, this is beautiful. So just one question over there. So you said it's small, so you could, you could just have a progenerator, you could add them. Yeah, uh -huh. you, that's essentially what I'm saying. It's just sort of, you could add them all up. Yes. Again, up to a question of having maybe two universes. <laughs> okay. all right, so, or if you want, we can say, we look at banner spaces, you know, we fix some inaccessible and just look at, at banner spaces we are not, well, are small with respect to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't want to start talking about the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we we have this isomorphism, which just, which just follows from the fact that uh, this is a closed symmetric model structure, also in the contracting category. So, so it commutes with uh, tensoring commutes with co-limits. Uh, and then this gives you this very nice claim that, uh, which is again like you would do in. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, is your M also in this band? Uh, M, M is a banner space. But what is co product of banner space? Uh, what is this less than or equal to one co product of banner spaces which are not in this? Subject? Well, this, the, the co-product of banner spaces is well defined. Again, it's, it would ju just be summable sequences, just with elements in the banner space. The only difference would be if you were thinking of this as Archimedean or non-Archimedean, and some ability changes. But. So in general, well, I, I just used the notation for K, but for a family of banner spaces like MI, this makes sense, right? And the diagram, well, all the morphisms, the <laughs> this, I can think of it as in living in the contracting category. Um, so from this we get sort of like a nice claim that allows us to do, well, again, sort of simple algebra. I mean, suppose you have a functor from Banach spaces to Banach spaces. Okay, uh, which is say right exact, and I'll call it sort of strongly continuous. By that I mean that it commutes uh, with uh, these contracting co-limits. So it's uh, then f of something is just equivalent to this something tensor over k with f of k. Exactly like you have in vector spaces. Only there you don't need this sort of strong continuity because you just have one generator. And in this, this sort of strong continuity means that if you know it on, on k, you know it also on all these contracting co-products of k. So you know it on all generators and hence you, you know it for everything. So, so a, a nice easy corollary of this is that you have like a Tanakian formalism in this setting. Uh, in other words, as I have sort of age, well, in, you can then sort of generalize this to inbun formally, but suppose I have age uh, like a bi-algebra, right? Then I can look at sort of the category of age co-modules and it's forgetful functor, well, by that, these are age co-modules inside in bun. There's a forgetful functor into in bun. And uh, so, well, let's call this forget. Then age can be reconstructed from this forgetful functor. And this is sort of an easy theory. It's a, it's a Barbeck statement. So this, um, 
Do you consider both as uh, asset cases or are they enhanced over in, in, by enriching? Uh, for this, you, you don't need uh, to enrich them, but you, you can if you want. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, I think I don't have enough. I wanted to say more than I have time to say, but but maybe the interesting thing, just from this perspective, just a remark. Um, Uh, also, in this setting, you can. It makes sense to sort of work with sort of uh, Banach uh, you know, group cohomology, cohomology, um, where by that I mean it's more like uh, thinking if I have a Hopf algebra, right? I can I, I can define sort of invariance, or if you want co-invariance, and take derived functors of that. So. It's more like sort of a group scheme uh, uh, cohomology, but in this Banach or in Banach setting. Uh, and an interesting observation is that in some cases, this, well, this thing is very related to what's known as a bounded uh, cohomology. Um, well, as for instance, used by Gromov. Um, I mean, there, there's a very precise thing to say. I mean, this. This is bounded cohomology for certain groups, definitely for discrete groups and for some topological groups. You can also, it's also true. You need to be careful, exactly. But, but these sort of statements are true, and the remark is that, um, well, it's a bit uh, somehow. If you look at the ABC conjecture uh, for, well, in the geometric setting or for the function field case. Uh, in terms of what's sort of known the Spiro inequality, which is an equivalent form of the ABC conjecture. So something very surprising I found out quite recently is that, well, actually this was proven by Milner in 1958. So it was proven, of course there are many proofs for the function field case, was, but this was proven by Milner in 1958. Uh, of course, he, this was before there was the ABC conjecture and the Spiro inequality. What Milner was interested in was understanding flat bundles on the Riemann surface. Or if, I mean, he was interested in sort of PSL2 R bundles on the Riemann surface and sort of giving a criterion when they are flat. And he wrote down an inequality in terms of the Euler number of the bundle. Somehow, should, if it's smaller than the Euler characteristic, then it's a flat bundle. It's an if and only if statement. And, and one direction is exactly the Spiro inequality in this function field case. And you can phrase this proof in terms of, uh, this was done later, this can actually has a very beautiful proof in terms of bounded cohomology. This is not what Milner did, but bounded cohomology didn't exist then, but, uh, but you can phrase it. Um, and then you can ask, well, is, is there sort of maybe a possible possibility to do something similar sort of uh, in the sort of number field case? Uh, okay, I, I can't say I, I know how to do that, but, but part of the reason to develop all of this machinery is to do something like that. So if you look at the, the structure that in, is involved in here, comes from sort of looking at bounded cohomology and homology, and there's a natural pairing between them, but the interesting thing is that bounded cohomology, the difference between, the reason why this works is that bounded cohomology comes with a norm. I mean, if you think about it, all of these cohomology groups in here, since they are in this sort of setting of Banach spaces, the cohomology groups by themselves will be Banach spaces, or at least will be in the left heart of this uh, of Banach spaces. So they would come with natural norms on them. And these norms, would, uh, this is exactly what allows you to prove this inequality very easily. Because you have sort of natural norms on your cohomology groups. Um, now you can ask, is there something similar you can do in, so you can define, for instance, for Galois groups, you can define sort of bounded Galois cohomology and 
and so on. And, and again, these, th these comes with natural norms. And this would be related, well, I won't have time, but some of the thing to do here is what you might call a version of sort of bounded uh, motivic uh, cohomology. Which, again, just for trivial nonsense reason, I can define, but I don't know yet if it has the good property. But if, if it does have good properties, that it would prove the ABC conjecture. Well, at least it might prove that. If it, well, definitely if it has the good properties that I would like it to have. Okay, so I didn't tell you yet anything about uh, derived geometry, I guess. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, so how do we do geometry out of, of this? So my point is just that, well, we have sort of a nice category of test objects. So what is it? Uh, well, if we want to do <coughs> derived geometry, um, so we have these, well, this nice category of in Banach over K. Now, deriving it, well, I can work with the derived category. It's easier just to sort of add a little S here, which means that I'm working with simplicial objects, so in this category. Um, and then the, the next thing I can do, uh, so this is again, it's a closed symmetric monoidal category. And it actually, it, it also has a, a model structure, if you like to think in that way, and it's sort of a symmetric monoidal model structure. It all has the nice things you want. So you, and I can look at sort of uh, the category of commutative uh, algebras in here. So these will be sort of like sim simplicial commutative rings. Um, and then what, what would be a functor of points? Well, it's just a functor from here to simplicial sets. So if you want, you can call such a thing uh, an analytic, uh, or maybe bornological pre-stack. So I can just work with this category of functors from, from these test objects to simplicial sets. So this is well, it's a huge category. I mean, it contains lots and lots of things. Some of them have maybe nothing to do with analytic geometry. Actually, for instance, if K is, let's say, the real numbers, then this, this category also knows about, uh, about differential geometry, not just about analytic geometry. So, uh, but, but the nice thing, I, I don't care that this is a huge category that contains lots of things because it's a very nice category. I mean, there are lots of ugly objects, but it's nice to have a nice category. Then I can just do whatever I want and only later care if the resulting thing is nice or not. Um, so, um, so now there are sort of an, an extra ingredient. What in is S? Simplicial. Um, so a nice, uh, well, another discussion we should have is sort of what kind of Grothendieck uh, topologies are there on this. Uh, and there are several, and so there are sort of uh, Grothendieck uh, topologies uh, on this category. And actually, the reason why I, I introduced sort of simplicial, because you can, uh, you can actually introduce Grothendieck topologies also before going derived. For instance, the flat topology, or what you might call the analytic Zariski topology, works in the non-derived setting. But the problem with that is it doesn't give you enough uh, open sets. Right, in analytic geometry, we like to sort of well, think of something like this. If you have a disk and a small disk inside, this is an open subset. The thing is that if you work with the flat or sort of Zariski, things need to be dense, right? So you wouldn't see these pictures if you don't put derived. What's nice about this picture is that somehow the self-intersection or the derived self-intersection of this with itself is itself. So, uh, so this is why, I, but for that I need to use derived uh, concepts. Um, so if I work in the derived setting, I, I get all the open sets that are usually used in analytic geometry. That's the reason to do that. And another thing to note, and this is sort of related to this question about that actually all of these things are enriched, that uh, if you sort of, well, for a representable, uh, pre-stack, 
right? So I can look at things that just come from a simplicial object. I mean, a simplicial commutative ring and the representable free stack it defines. So since all my categories are enriched and actually all of these, the home spaces involved will have extra structures that will have sort of, because they're sort of subsets of the, well, they're sort of ring morphisms, but they'll have norms on them, right? So for a presentable pre stack, uh, we naturally uh, get a functor into well, what what would be sort of simplicial end normed sets. So what 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 is that thing? So a normed set is just sort of a set with a function on it from x to r plus. Um, and then, the, well, you might add a base point if you want to this set. Uh, uh, and this and the point is that norm sets, uh, right? Between norm sets, you can define the notion of a bounded map, the same way you do for Banach uh, or normed uh, vector spaces. So you get a category exactly for the same reasons. This category is not complete or co-complete because of boundedness issues. So I, I take the int completion of it, and then I can look at sort of simplicial objects in it, and then uh, so I can really enrich my functors from here into, I can look at sort of simplicial in norm sets instead of just simplicial sets. Sorry? Uh, it's just this, well, it's a set with the norm on it. it it's just a, it's a function to R plus, which you... It's just norm the vector space, but without the structure of well, the, yeah, there's no, no addition or... No quality. Well, there's no addition or any... I mean, you just have a set with a, just a notion of a norm of the elements on it. Yeah, I mean, the point is that if, if I look at morphisms in here, right, they come with natural norms on them uh, for representable object. So I can just remember this, so I get this extra structure. Uh, you, you can do different versions. I mean, as before, we can talk about norm sets, we can talk about se semi-norm sets, we can... Uh, but these, in this case, we know that things will be really norm. Right? Um, so... Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the remark is that... Uh, and that's another part of this big project. Uh, so so uh, if we use the sort of, right, if we look at the, these in norm sets and we look at simplicial, so this is a version of doing sort of unstable normed homotopy theory. Then we can sort of stabilize this just, uh, formally and get notions of normed spectra. And it's interesting to note that sort of, for instance, bounded cohomology, which up till now is in some sense defined ad hoc, is becomes representable in this category. And, and you can see that, for instance, you can give uh, bounded versions also of algebraic A theory or other things like that if, if you work in this uh, norm setting from the start, yeah. Yeah. I, in you, yeah, actually level-wise commutative. You, you can work with sort of e infinity objects if you want, or uh, you, you'll get equivalent theories. Right, so. Um, so, yeah, so the point is that if you stabilize, you, so you, using this as, so usually when we start doing topology, we start with simplicial sets and then stabilize or not and build sort of uh, spectra or classifying spaces in there. But now we can, the, the exercise somehow is to do, just do all of mathematics again, but instead of working with uh, sets, work with norm sets. Uh, and, and in some sense, you know, if you think about uh, sort of like, both like a uh, Rakelov geometry or other, I mean, what, what happens now in that somehow people try to impose certain norms on objects. And it's, and that's, I think, part of the problem why it's, it doesn't get you where you want because uh, you do lots of constructions and it's not clear that uh, 
the norms you carry around are sort of the correct ones. So you want some framework where the norms are just part of the, of the structure from the start. So somehow, the, for instance, well, when you, well, like I said here, if you have some representable object, then it comes with sort of natural norms. So the geometry captures what sort of the, the norm is, and then this is where the way to do what I told you, the sort of, uh, the sort of normed or bounded uh, motivic homology. This is sort of the framework to do it. Um, but somehow your norms are real variables. Yes, yes, that's, um, okay. that's I, I agree. I mean, you, you might think of maybe other way. I mean, I, I'm using the real numbers sort of uh, from the start as, yeah. So it's not as pure as maybe one, and, but it seems to work. So um, now in, in terms of sort of like basic building blocks, um, so y you can look at sort of, um, if you have, let's say, well, some mana space, I can look at this contracting symmetric algebra. So what would this be? Well, just I can take the, this contracting coproduct over n of s n of v. Um, of course, I can also take the, the symmetric algebra, which would be the sort of formal uh, sort of. Uh, uh. Now, the interesting thing is that this, in the non-Archimedean setting, this is exactly, well, for instance, if I take something like this, uh, is a Tate algebra. So the Tate algebra is, is sort of very easily defined from this perspective. Um, so if you want to do, like I said before, uh, this category is huge and over R, for instance, it knows about uh, differential geometry, it knows about everything. Uh, and of course it also knows because in the band also just contains vector spaces, it knows about just usual schemes or usual pre-stacks. but. Uh, if you want, you can ask yourself about things that are just sort of constructed from some basic objects that would make them analytic. Um, so, uh, so in this, uh, so the point is that, so we have sort of like these Tate algebras, and so by taking uh, like limits or co-limits, which we're allowed to do, we can define like the algebras of analytic functions, let's say on on a disk of radius less than one. So this would be like an, this would be a Fréchet algebra, an inverse limit of, of such Tate algebras. Or, well, there's like a, a dagger disk. So these would be like, this is a dagger. And um, over convergent functions on the disk of radius one or, or analytic functions on affine space. So you can build all of these objects from the basing basic building blocks just by, so this will be just an inverse limit of these things. This will be a, a diary or a core limit of such things. This is again an inverse limit, just uh, bigger. So now maybe I'll just, I'll finish with sort of, I told you that there's also a global picture and there's something very interesting going on here. So here, the point is that uh, everything works. Well, you have to check, but uh, uh, well, if instead of a field, you just use for Banach rings. So complete normed rings. Uh, for instance, the example is, for instance, Z or the ring of integers in the function field. So you, you can do, I mean, everything I said just works there. Um, and then, and again, you'll have these sort of basic building blocks. So you can define Tate algebras over Z, let's say. Um, and, and you can, for instance, look at uh, something like a disk of radius less than one uh, over Z. Now, so this will be an inverse limit. So the way to think about this is that, well, functions on this object, these will be sort of uh, formal power series with integer coefficients that converge sort of for, for a radius less than one. So you can realize this as this algebra. Uh, and uh, of course, I can also look at uh, 
at something like this, functions on, let's say, A1 analytic over Z. Now, if you do this, uh, there's something very interesting going on. You'll just get a polynomial algebra, but you'll view this polynomial algebra in this sort of bornological setting. So this will come with, well, actually, it will be like a Frechet object, a Frechet algebra. So even though it's a set, it's just a polynomial algebra. It has all this family of semi-norms, so which remember exactly the correct completions. So in both of these cases, when, for instance, I, I can base change, there are sort of base change functors, let's say, with the complex numbers or with QP, if you want. And the resulting thing is what you might expect. You'll get sort of functions on a disk over C or functions on a disk, open disk over QP. And the same thing will happen here. So if I base change this, well, either with C or QP, I'll get sort of functions on a disk. Uh, sorry, this is affine space. Um, analytic functions over C, and this will be affine space over QP. Um, and so in both, so well, in here the, the remark is that the reason this happens is that since we're completing, right, then, and this has sort of all of these semi-norms and the completion has a chance and ends up being exactly this thing because of course, you know that polynomials are dense in here. Um, but I think what is more interesting in, from this global perspective is, is that you get um, what somehow this is an Archimedean object and this is a non-Archimedean object. So how come from just one object we can sort of get both? And, and this is where what I was sort of avoiding all the time. So this is an inverse limit of some Tate algebras. And when I work, let's say, over Z, I can define two versions of a Tate algebra. I can, because I, I can take this sort of Archimedean contracting colim or the non-Archimedean. So I have two notions of summability, right? And uh, so I, and it turns out that, that this is actually an inverse limit uh, of both of them. Because even though sort of the, these algebras on, on a closed disk are different, one is contained in the other if you increase the radius a bit. So in this inverse limit, it doesn't matter if you take the Archimedean or non-Archimedean version. So there's something very interesting going on here is that in the global picture, let's say over Z, you see both Archimedean and non-Archimedean phenomena at the same time. Uh, well, in terms of, it's both sort of uh, L1, it's sort of, it's, it's some ability, where the, it's being summable, Right? The only difference, what do I mean by being summable? Yes, uh, I, can, I can mean sort of that it actually sort of the, the sum of the absolute values of the is, is finite. Or I can mean something that the limit goes to zero. Right? Uh, there's sort of like a, an Archimedean and an Archimedean version of uh, L1. And, um, but, but they're compatible with each other. So, um, so that, that's an, an interesting remark about some, that somehow, even though rigid analytic geometry uses sort of closed disks as the building blocks, uh, it's not what you would use sort of in the, in the Archimedean or complex analytic setting. You, you can, but usually you use open disk or sort of Stein objects. Uh, but, but there's this interesting compatibility between these two. Um, well, I think I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I don't have any time anymore, but, but just, for instance, just to, to finish, notice that this object here, this, uh, this less than one over Z, is actually the, <coughs> the moduli space of Tate curves, right? So you can, uh, right, somehow, I have the parameter Q, well, minus zero. Uh, I have the parameter Q sitting in there, and a Tate curve would be something like the GM modulo Q to the Z, so you can define over this, uh, this moduli space the universal Tate curve. All the formulas are actually sort of defined over Z. They just come from the, the group operation right, of GM acting on itself. So you can just write everything over there and you can define the notion of sort of, uh, sort of analytic modular forms over Z. And I think this gives a, well, a conceptual explanation why for this fact that there is a a basis of uh, modular forms with integral coefficients. Uh, just because it is a base change of something defined over Z. So 
analytic object defined over Z. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm out of time, so thank you very much. <laughs>
spaces. I mean, you're, you're not, not in the sense of uh, you sort of want to view things that come with norms as part of their structure. Uh, so, a base, so, for instance, topological spaces will be embedded in there exactly using this construction. And, and, and sort of the, the spectrum, the homology of the spectrum will somehow give you the L1 homology. And the dual of this would be sort of bounded cohomology. So that's, um, this is the sort of flavor of these things. Let me say, well, let's okay. ask something much more trivial. Your norm sets, what are the morphisms? Are bounded? Bounded, yes. Yeah, otherwise, they're not too different from sets, yeah. So we are running quite uh, yeah. late. So I propose that further discussion will be with enjoying a cocktail. Let's thank you. Thank you.